Again, Boy George was a kingpin. You know, he himself wasn't putting in the work, but when you got that type of money, you got money on your payroll. So nobody would mess with George. Like, it's crazy for Fat Joe to say he had beef with George. Like, I couldn't believe it. I had to air him out. I heard that story. He also said he had he had beef with some dude named Boy George. Let me tell you a little science on Boy George. The dude Boy George was the first, well, not the first, but one of the most known drug kingpins in the Bronx. This guy was 18 years old, multi-millionaire status. The dude, the dude was so lethal that he got locked up in 1988. What year are we in today, Panda? 2023. And the boy is still locked up. Hey, what's up, y'all? Y'all know my slogan. I don't know it all, but I know what I've been through. Now, before we get into this video, please make sure you head on down to Instagram and follow us on our official Instagram page at hookah anonymous underscore. We're able to be a little more explicit, a little more uncensored, and share content freely without running the risk of having our channel terminated. So, once again, Make sure you head on down to Instagram and follow us on our official Instagram page at hookah anonymous underscore. We're almost at 100,000 subscribers. So if you like this video, make sure you subscribe and hit that bell so you notify every time we drop new content. Now let's get into what you guys came here to see. Now, this story is actually a personal favorite of mine for many reasons. And by the time we're done, you'll see exactly why. The person we'll be speaking on today is not only a teenage millionaire, but he was a teenage multi-millionaire that ran an operation that at its height made over $250,000 a week. Can you imagine having all that money before you're even legal to have a drink or get inside of a club? Well, George Rivera, AKA Boy George experienced it all. From the cars, money, clothes, woman, just any and everything you can think of. As a teen, he was already considered a kingpin from the Bronx supplying the tri-state area with ties reaching as far as Puerto Rico. Now, aside from the glitz and the glamour, like most kingpins from the 70s and the 80s era, Boy George would suffer at the hands of law enforcement and was given a very harsh life without parole sentence at such a young age. So although he played hard, they charged him even harder. And with law enforcement involved, came informants, which were the same people that played with Boy George but couldn't take the pressure once things started crashing down. One of the lessons I think is pivotal when it comes to these kingpin stories is to realize that everyone's going to be around when everyone's making money and get beneficial. But those same people that you thought were loyal to you was only loyal to the opportunities that you provided. And once these opportunities were no longer present, neither were their loyalty. Now, Boy George's story is pretty simple and quick, yet effective, but he had a very short run for someone who was considered kingpin status, which is interesting in itself. Boy George will only have a two year run and as quick as everything came is as quick as it left all in a matter of two years. Now, when you think about that, it'll really make you reevaluate the streets if you're in it because two years of making money literally costed him a lifetime behind bars. Once again, just for two years. I'm more than sure that if Boy George had the opportunity to do it all over again, he would never step foot in the streets because the risk wasn't worth the reward. Some people even argue that Boy George was given an unfair sentence because nothing in his paperwork officially charged him with the death of anybody. So people feel that receiving life for drug charges without any chance of parole is crazy. And I definitely agree. Despite whatever rumors are out there about you being behind bodies, it's what you can prove in the court of law. So without further ado, we're going to get into the story of a young teenage multi-millionaire by the name of Boy George who allegedly made over $15 million in his two year run, but paid a hefty price for it as well. At the time of his sentencing, he was considered one of the youngest to be hit with the Kingpin statue in New York. So make sure y'all hit that thumbs up button so we can get this video into the algorithm and spread awareness on stories like this. And hopefully it could reach someone that can use this information to encourage them to leave the streets alone. Subscribe to the channel if you aren't already. And let's get into the story of boy George, AKA, 
Puerto Rican James Bond. George Rivera, a.k.a. Boy George, was born and raised in the south side of Bronx, borough of New York, in 1968. At the time he came up, the Bronx was every bit of harsh as a predominantly Latin neighborhood was overran by drugs, drug users, drug dealers, and abandoned buildings due to fires. It was nowhere to raise a family, but if you did, the kids wouldn't have much of a role model to look up to. It was either you played basketball, sold drugs, or you used them. You take your pick. So in the atmosphere like that, times were very hard. George grew up struggling, and his mother was the head of their household due to his father leaving the house pretty early at a time a male figure was needed. They say the father left the house before George could even turn one years old. It was these hard times that encouraged George to run away from home, where he would often spend a lot of time in the streets. And we know the more you're in the streets, the more you become curious, and just like they say, curiosity kills the cat. One time George ran away at the age of 12, and this would be one of his last times running away from home because he would find himself in a house that was structured mainly for troubled teens in the Bronx, mainly what you would consider a group home. Since then, that's when he would spend most of his childhood staying inside of group homes, which forced him to mature fast due to the environment of other troubled teenagers that was present there as well. The group home wouldn't stop any trouble from those troubled teenagers because even in the group home, he would still manage to get in trouble in the streets, but this time it was with the law. George would find himself being arrested and sent to a juvenile detention facility for minors that broke the law. He would serve a year in juvie, and after he was released, it would go downhill from there, as George would then drop out of high school and jump into the streets. A friend who was already in the lifestyle by the name of Joey Navarro would introduce George to the lifestyle and efforts to help him out. He was the one that also gave George the name Boy George, not to get it confused with the music artist Boy George neither. George started hustling for a family called the Torres family, who'd been in the game since the 70s, moving ace drugs all through the uptown area of New York. That same family made so much money that they bought a bunch of property in Puerto Rico and also bought the infamous $30 million mall out there as well. George met a guy by the name of Ward Johnson, aka 60, who drove dollar cabs and was very resourceful when it came to the streets. He became George's second in command and right hand man and also helped George to become one of the biggest suppliers of H in the Bronx. Sources say the operation started in the spring of 1987 when George and Johnson would buy 100 grams of the product and never look back. George would put a team together that consisted of friends he met in the group home, mail workers, and a few others. Two associates would cut and package the product at George's apartment on East 213th Street in the Bronx during the summer of 1987. It's said that in the beginning of the enterprise, George and his team would distribute up to 100K worth of product in a week in the beginning of his run, and which sources say grew to 250 when it was all said and done. Although George was doing his thing, things would get even more hectic for him and a sudden takedown would happen in June that forced him to automatically level up. In June of 1987, when he was just 19 years old, members of the Torres family that boy George worked for was busted and arrested by DA agents in Puerto Rico, and the sting even spread it all the way to New York as well as 40 members of the organization was caught out there too. This takedown will leave an opening for anybody to now step in and take over the organization. And that, boy George did. But that would be a big mistake that would cost him in the long run. As he would take over, George recruited most of the guys from the Bronx, New York area to fill out certain positions within his team. That team consisted of men that was very highly feared and played no games when it came to Boy George and the organization he created called the Obsession Game. The crew sold product under the moniker Obsession and the authorities say that George hired hitmen who was willing to kill anybody that crossed his path trying to harm George or the operation. This includes workers that also came up short or stole. And what made Boy George a smart leader and well loved by the guys he kept around him was the fact that George did good business and made sure he took extra care of the people around him, keeping them fed. Sources say he gave cash bonuses, gifts, and free vacations to his top earners in the crew, something like what a real manager or boss would do in a Fortune 500 company. However, this is the same guy who never played about being old money or someone shorting him when it came to his money. This is the same guy who authorities believe was linked to 12 bodies although he was never convicted for a single homicide during his two-year run. George was known for a lot of things, 
but his cause is what led him to get the alias, the Puerto Rican James Bond. One thing about boy George, he didn't play when it came to the cause. While most kids his age was worried about getting fly, dating girls in school, boy George was swapping high-end luxury cars by the fleet. Legend has it that boy George had over 20-something cars. Not no BS ones neither. At just a teen, George gained a lot of attention because he drove around in Ferraris, BMWs, Benzes, and Porsches. The $140,000 customized black Porsche had a crazy audio system in it, a telephone, VCR, a color TV, thick custom rugs, gun compartments that slid open at a touch, and ostrich skin seats that he was known for having commonly throughout all his vehicles. James Bond was one of his idols, and the reason he spent over $50,000 in custom features added to his 190 kitted up Mercedes Benz. It included radar detectors front and rear, the license plate slid into a slide compartment, and a strobe light blinded anyone following him. Secret compartments in the door panels and the floor hid weapons and money acting as stash boxes. Another feature was the squirted box of oil from the tail of the car, while a hit it switch flipped the box in the trunk that sprayed nail-like tacks on the road if he was ever being pursued. In his BMW, he had a button that would cause loaded handguns to pop out of concealed apartments that you wouldn't be able to see if you didn't know it was there. On top of all that, George kept a Bentley, Porsche, Ferrari, and Lamborghini in his garage. In a nutshell, all of his cars had $12,000 ostrich skin interiors, 630 watt stereos, 10 track CD players, televisions, VCRs, and cell phones. It's safe to say that George was very flamboyant, but with the type of money he was making, he definitely had a reason to be. George loved wearing silk shirts, was well mannered, attentive, and confident. Sources say he also had a very distinctive echo and big laugh. He had many women, mainly of Puerto Rican descent, scattered across the Bronx borough, but had all types. Some that were a part of the poverty stricken neighborhoods, but also more upscale ones too. George kept his women in leather and furs. A lot of them tattooed property of George on their bodies as well. He had one girlfriend wear a 22 karat gold Boy George nameplate around her neck. But one thing about George, you couldn't be a woman around him and be a slouch. One girlfriend said he always liked everything spotless from the house to the clothes, and he never liked to see anything dirty. She also stated that she didn't have to get a job as she just had to cook and clean and take care of things around the house and receive an allowance at the end of the week. As much as George enjoyed his cars and women, he also enjoyed boxing. Rumor has it that George was very good with his hands and everyone a part of his crew was too. George even sported a chain with a pendant of two tiny gold boxing gloves that symbolized the Golden Gloves boxing competition he trained so hard for. He also worked out a lot and trained heavily, as one of his trusted lieutenants, Will Clawson, was the son of a professional boxer. So George didn't only train and worked out, he also ate healthy food as well. To be a young kid, it seems like George definitely had discipline, which transpired into his hustle. At 21 years old, George owned shopping malls and commercial real estate. He controlled 15 spots in the Bronx and Manhattan, and cleaned his money by purchasing property in Puerto Rico just like the Torres family. Rumor has it, he was buying homes in Puerto Rico, ranging anywhere from $100,000 to $300,000 cash. Keep in mind that this was in the 80s, so imagine what $300,000 is worth in today's climate. Now here's where things would take a downward spiral for the young boy George. Everything came crashing down pretty fast. August 27, 1987, the same friend, Joey Navarro, that introduced boy George to the game cooperated with the law as he became an informant himself. The same way he introduced George to the game, he would set George up by introducing him to an undercover cop named Joseph Mendez, posing as a hustler trying to re-up buying two ounces of H, almost 90% pure, for $12,000. On October 6, 1987, the undercover and the informant Joey Navarro would meet up with boy George again at a restaurant to buy more product from George. But this time, he had 6-0 with him and another top enforcer at the time of the deal, and this time the undercover would buy 600 glassine envelopes of product for $5,000. George's right-hand man 6-0 would see who George sold to and inform George that he may have been an undercover cop just from his appearance. Lo and behold, he was right. But George took his advice 
and that was the last time George ever sold anything to the undercover cop Mendez. However, the damage was already done, because not only did he already sell large quantities to an undercover cop, but he also informed the undercover that they were selling over two keys a week. More trouble would follow George, because after a burglary attempt on one of his apartments on 213th Street, where product was cut and packaged, he would switch locations moving the operation to Manhattan. And this was a small move, because at this point, police was on to him. In late August or early September, police would learn of the 213th Street abandoned apartment, and when they raided on unrelated charges searching for George, they would find a few incriminating items that were left behind. They found a bulletproof vest, shotgun, glassine envelopes, H-cut and paraphernalia, a Bowie knife, and a bunch of evidence. When George got wind of the raid of his old apartment, he attempted to switch the name of his product to try and throw off the police, as now it's been confirmed that they know of his product. He switched it to Delirious, but would shortly go back to Obsession due to the customers developing a loyalty to only that brand. Fast forward to Christmas Eve, December 24th, 1988, where more trouble will follow George after making a horrible mistake by having a yacht party known as the Black Tie event for his guys. George chartered the River Ronda yacht that costed about $38,000 an hour and he had it for three hours. He provided food, rentals, tuxedos, liquor, and everything you could think of including Big Daddy Kane and other rappers for music along with a DJ. The food menu consisted of steak tart today, skewered lamb, prime rib, and $12,000 just in champagne alone. Raffles was given out for attendees to win luxury prizes, consisted of $20,000 as the first prize, a Rolex watch as the second prize, a trip to Hawaii was the third prize, and a trip to Disneyland was the fourth. A fully loaded Mitsubishi was the grand prize. He then gave one of his lieutenants, Walter Ice Cook, a brand new 750 BMW, and 6 got a Rolex and $50,000 in cash. His top four men were given solid gold belts with their names encrusted in diamonds that costed $8,000 each. But here's where it gets interesting. The party goals were seated at tables organized by spot location. The men from East Spots wore bands of the same color, red for one distribution group, purple for another, and gold for the third. Those that arrived together stayed together, the managers sat amongst the pitchers and dealers who worked for them. Now remember this key detail as it will also play into how people were targeted for their roles in the organization and tied them to Boy George's drug operation. Early April of 1989, law enforcement would tap Boy George's house phone for 28 days and listen to his conversations coming out of the 1665 Morris Avenue home. Out of those same conversations, around 58 of them were taken and presented as evidence against him when he was prosecuted in court. Those same conversations will also prove that George was the one supplying the product and was actually the boss of the whole operation and not just a soldier. On April 30th, 1989, police moved in on a cut and package spot located on 740 East, 243rd Street. They had surveillance set up on the spot and would catch footage of men going in and out of the spot displaying suspicious activity. One individual by the name of Jimmy Cavares was spotted leaving the evening and was apprehended by police. Upon search, he had 10,400 glassine envelopes on his persons of the Obsession product. Then two other individuals would leave the apartment and was also apprehended shortly after. Upon search, police found 8,718 glassine envelopes of the Obsession product as well. So it seems like everyone coming out of that spot would be caught with product. So just a few hours later in the early morning of May 1st at 2.30 a.m., officers decided to raid the location where they already caught the other individuals leaving with product. The suspect activity is what made them make a move, and when they did, they would arrest 11 members and find 10 bricks, ledges, loaded weapons, scales, glassine envelopes with the Obsession logo upon the raid. That's when his right-hand man 6-0 called and told George the news and then explained to him that he needs to flee the country ASAP because things are about to get crazy. However, the very next morning when he would wake up and leave his apartment, a swarm of federal agents were already outside waiting for boy George. At the time of his arrest, he wasn't carrying anything illegal except for $7,000 in cash. While he was arrested and taken into custody, 
Law enforcement would get a warrant to search his apartment, found address books along with names, numbers, money, money to be paid out to guys working for him, and transactions dating back to the last two years, making it easy for police. Remember that Christmas Eve party that he threw on the yacht? Well, George made a photo album of that event, which would come back to haunt him because it was found in his home while officers were searching his place. All it did was prove who was associated with him and pin names and faces and vice versa. And remember when I said that every crew was properly seated in their own section at the party? Well, that's how they were able to identify who was who and what role they played in the operation. The company that rented the yacht to him had to share all the information with law enforcement as well and they had to show financial records. Knowing how much money was spent, Boy George will have to explain how he acquired all that money as well. In May of 1989, 31 people that was affiliated with Boy George would be arrested. Within the 31 members, his right hand man 6-0 was caught up in there and was also one of the main ones to testify against Boy George. He later became a star witness. Him snitching would get his son out of jail too due to his son's affiliation with George and the organization. Almost all of the members of his organization would immediately flip on George and start cooperating with law enforcement. They gave up stash spots, drug spots, transactions, names, bodies, everything. In an indictment that was filed in August of 1990, George would be charged with running a drug enterprise from 1987 to 1989. Legend has it that it was a hit list that Boy George created for everyone who cooperated against him. The feds would later link Boy George to at least six people who were supposed to cooperate in that case, but ended up not making it. They could never prove it though. One of the informants who were also George's right hand man would be found in the trunk of a parking lot. When it was all said and done, George was charged with conspiracy to distribute product and attempted income tax evasion. For that, in April of 1991, Boy George was sentenced to life in prison without possibility of parole at just 23 years old. And that's where the story ends. Throughout the years, George would still fight to get an appeal for his case, arguing that his sentencing was illegal. I'm not saying that what he did was right, but nobody is perfect. And I do find it insane how he was given life without possibility of parole and he wasn't charged with any homicides or violence at all. Just conspiracy and tax evasion. So just think about it, locked up since 1991 and we're now in 2024, which means that George was locked up at the young age of 23 and spent 33 years behind bars, making him 56 years old now. Now I'm not perfect myself, nor do I claim to be, so everyone may not agree with me. However, 33 years for just conspiracy and tax evasion is crazy. But I would like to know what y'all think in the comments below. Do y'all think his punishment was justified? Or do y'all think he was illegally sentenced? Now 50 Cent stated that he wanted to do a story on Boy George. I'm unsure when it's coming out or even if it's in production at all. But with the success he's been having in television, I think he'll be the right person to highlight a story just like this. It may bring some type of awareness to this case. I'm not sure but like I said 50 Cent is the perfect person for this because he's actually somebody that came from the streets and will have a little more understanding than somebody who did. Alright. Now, like I said, this is a situation that's very sad because if you pay attention, he only spent two years on the streets. You know, I know a lot of guys, they see the fast money, um, they're cool with the instant gratification, but at what cost? Because this man was 23 years old and completely lost his life. He didn't even have a chance to live his life. He lived for two years, literally. I don't, he could have bought the biggest house. He could have bought the most expensive car. He could have bought an island, but guess what? None of that is here today. He lost 33 years of his life at just 23 years old. You know, so it's just insane for the people that's out there in the streets. Like I said, I'm not perfect. I once was in the streets, but some of us get it with a brick. Some of us get it with a feather. Some of us get it when it's too late. And this is one of those situations where someone may have gotten it when it was too late. I can almost guarantee that if Boy George had to do it all over again, he wouldn't do it the same way he did it before. You know, whether he thought that it was just going to be a slap on the wrist because it was his first time, whatever the case may be, man, I'm sure he would do it all over again because 33 years of your life at 23 years old, 
is insane to me. I'd rather go get a nine to five. None of that money is worth it because guess what? What are you doing with it now? What can you do with it now? And I don't care how much money he had. At the end of the day, if he has kids, and I, I think he has a son, if I'm not mistaken. But if you have a kid, that money isn't lasting all the way up to now. 33 years, it's not lasting. So you can't say, oh, I did it for my children. I did it. it it's a crazy situation, man. But, you know, we all make mistakes. None of us is perfect. And um, like I said, I hope something works out in his favor because whether he did whatever he did in the streets or not, none of us is perfect, you know? So let's just see what comes out of this, man. I hope y'all enjoyed this story. Y'all get in the comments. If y'all want somebody else, y'all want me to do a story on or whatever, just let it be known in the comments and I'll get to it when I can. Y'all jump in the comments. Let me know how y'all feel about this. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Hit that bell so you're notified every time we drop new content. And remember, as long as you keep on watching, I'm going to keep on dropping. I'm out.